Coming up next, Book TV presents Afterwards, an hour-long interview program where we invite a guest host to interview the author of a new book. This week, Gail Collins, the first woman to hold the position of editorial page editor for the New York Times, explores the changes in the lives of American women over the past 50 years in her book, When Everything Changed, The Amazing Journey of American Women from 1960 to the Present. Ms. Collins remarks on the differences between a time when New York City Secretary Lois Rabinowitz was upbraided for wearing slacks in court to the formation of the National Organization for Women and the presidential campaign of Hillary Clinton. Gail Collins discusses her book with Gwen Eiffel, the managing editor and moderator of PBS's Washington Week and senior correspondent for the NewsHour with Jim Lehrer. Hi, I'm Gwen Eiffel of PBS, and I'm here today on C-SPAN Afterwards, joined by Gail Collins, the first editorial page editor, woman editorial page <laughs> editor of the New York Times, and currently a columnist for the New York Times, and the new author of When Everything Changed, The Amazing Journey of American Women from 1960 to the Present. Gail Collins, welcome. Thank you. I have to start by just asking the obvious question. What changed? <laughs> oh, nothing. It's <laughs> nothing all at same. all. It's been very... Exactly the same. You know, I've got to tell you, this, this sort of started this whole project. When I was um, at the Times, and it was the millennium was coming, and, you know, the millennium retrospectives were happening, mm -hmm. and we had war over the last thousand years, and peace over the last thousand years, and cats Y2K. over the last thousand years, whatever. And the magazine did one on women over the last thousand years, and they asked me to do the introduction. And when I did it, and it's, I'm dim that I had not really thought about this before, I thought, wow, the vision of really at base what women are capable of doing and what their limitations are and what their place in the world is was not at base much different in 1960 than it was in the year 1000. And that historic visions of women that have existed forever, you know, changed in my lifetime, were just smashed in my little lifetime, which is a tiny second in all this. And it just knocked me out, you know, and I knew I really wanted to write about that. But you could have written about this in a very, and I'm happy to say it's not a dry book at all. It's very engaging. Thank you. And you could have written about it that way. You could have just written a history of the American mm. woman since 1960. Instead, you got voices in it. You talk to the women who actually lived it. That seems to make the difference. You have to, you have to tell things in a story. It has to be the stories. It's always the stories that drive things. And I'm also a person who, um, if I look at a picture of the Magna Carta being signed, I really want to know like what kind of shoes they wore, <laughs> where they went to the bathroom, and you know how were they happy. So that stuff, you know, what the fact that we couldn't wear pants in 1960, um, you know, the girdle thing, and the empty orange you know, juice. There are going to be people younger than you and I watching this program, oh, and they I'm may sorry. not know what you mean by the girdle thing, for instance. <laughs> <laughs> and I mean, there, this was a huge I am so sorry, young ma woman. matter of oppression for yes. women. Yes. Oh, it was terrible. The book starts with this, with Louise Rabinowitz, who in 1960 was kicked out of the traffic court of Manhattan for attempting to pay a parking ticket while wearing slacks. For her boss, not even yes, for herself. Yes, for her boss. It was her boss's ticket. And the, the, the magistrate was just furious that the dignity of the traffic court had been so violated by this woman wearing slacks walking in. And poor Lois got her husband, who had only been married to her for two weeks at the time, to come and pay the ticket. And uh, the judge yelled at the husband and said, you better clamp down on this young woman before it's too late. And that was so much. So many of the women I talked to said it was such a pain to always have to wear a skirt everywhere. And you really did. And this judge also said he, he objected to her, to her taking herself off this pedestal right. that he had women on. Right. You, needed, you couldn't have a pedestal and wear slacks. You have to, if you wanted to be on the pedestal, you had to wear a skirt. That was all there was. Because there. you could, what, look under the skirt? Is I'm that not the, was that, I was wondered that the about problem? that. You know, the thing about the, the pedestal that I've always loved is the idea of putting somebody on a pedestal. You are up high, but you cannot move at all. You are really stuck right there. And you can't you get down if you choose to. And you can't to. get down if you choose to. And this becomes a running theme, actually. I just, I'll just i skip ahead. I, I want to talk about the pants politics, mm -hmm. because I think we're both wearing slacks today. We're yeah, comfortable. Yeah, yeah, we're happy. Yeah. We're liberated women. But you know what? This kept coming up over and over again. It's like almost a running theme. And you know, when I was writing the book, I realized that when I was in college, we were not allowed to leave the dorm wearing slacks unless we were going bowling. 
<laughs> and there was so much alleged bowling going on at Marquette <laughs> University, I cannot tell you. But it was, and, and women who worked for the post office told me, you know, that they had to wear, you know, they could wear slacks to work, but then you had to change into a skirt. And of course, if you had a skirt on, then you had to wear nylons. This is before pantyhose were invented. Had to wear nylons, and with the nylons to hold them up, you had to wear a girdle. And I also talked to so many women who, when they were kids going to high school, when they were teeny, skinny little girls, <laughs> had to wear these girdles when they were on their way to school. It was an, uh, you know, an incredibly restricting thing, and there is something about the way women dressed over the centuries that, that there was this sense that you're not going to be moving around a whole lot because <laughs> we got you here. You that know? was the design. But you know, you met, you write about uh, something that Richard Nixon in 1973 yes. said to Helen Turned Thomas. To Helen Thomas and said, Helen, are you comfortable in those pants? I know women in China I saw wearing them, but it really bothers me very much. You know? I can't imagine and, Helen Thomas took that very well. Well, you know, I'm, I, but I'm sure that the pants stayed <laughs> on. I guarantee you. I am convinced they did. <laughs> Let's talk about the, the, the moments over time, over these 50 years that you write about that that switched the, the light on for a lot of women. There were obviously the ob overt ones, but let's start with some of the, the ones I considered to be more subtle. Like I didn't really consider how much birth control, the easy availability of birth control changed women and had more to do with liberating women it than any so march. Huge. So huge. It was so huge because until then, you know, but women had always, women are no dopes. They've always used birth control, but until the pill, the stuff that you could get or use was really very helpful if your goal was to have three children rather than 12 children. But if your goal was to not get pregnant at all, it was really not reliable. And it was only, and there's some wonderful charts that some sociologists have done showing that just as the pill became readily available, which was really not until later in the 60s and the early 70s for single women, as it became available, applications to medical schools and law schools really? just shot up because how could you commit yourself to careers that are going to take you a decade maybe to get going if you're not really sure that you can stop from getting pregnant. So by allowing women to delay childbearing all kinds of opportunities were yes, open. Yes, totally and absolutely. Pill is huge. Um, it also empowered women sexually. Yeah, the whole, the sexual, you know, there were so many revolutions in yeah. the 60s and 70s, most popular by far the sexual <laughs> revolution was. And it was really all about women. It was about ending the double standard because there had always been the presumption that men had the right to go out and try to have sex and enjoy themselves. But women were supposed to be chaste until they got married. And of course, to protect your chastity, you wanted to get married early, otherwise more dangers would arise. And once you're married, of course, if you don't have the pill, then you're going to get pregnant. So it all sort of squished in together. And if you actually committed yourself to a career before all these changes happened, it was like taking the veil. You know, I will see no man, you know, and I'm going to spend the next 20 years of my life becoming a doctor. But, you know, men beware. I'm... I'm <laughs> none like in my virtue out there. And so that was just huge. Women had more choices in all kinds of ways. Mm -hmm. But so often, the economy was the dictate of whether a woman had a choice or not. You went out to work because your man had gone to war mm -hmm. in the Vietnam War, or because you just couldn't afford anymore to, to stay at home. Yeah, and poorer women had always worked. We developed this nice, tidy myth that women did not work, particularly after they were married. Women did not work after they were married. Unless you were poor, and then you did, but nobody paid any attention to you anyway. And the, the myth in the 50s and the 60s that you know, all housewives stayed home with their children was a myth that was created by basically upper middle class people. But it is true that that was the vision of the good life. The good mm -hmm. life was if you didn't work and you were a success, if you managed to marry a guy who did so well that he could support you. And miraculously, there was this one glorious window of opportunity after World War II in which a family really could achieve this brand new, wow, spectacular lifestyle that no nation in the world had ever given on a wide scale to its people before. You could have a house, you could have a car, TV, you could send you your kids to, to college, you, you could, could go to the suburbs. Yeah. You could do all this on one person's salary because inflation was so low, salaries were going up, the rest of the world was really not coming out of the, you know, the war yet, and they were really not competing. We were creating all the wealth of the planet practically at that point. We were doing so well. Men, of course, got veterans benefits, low-income loans. Everything was fantastic for about 
10, 15 years there. This worked really well. Then the 70s came. 